Right, it's a, it's a pleasure to have uh, Ami Hanani give the third and final talk of his lecture. So over to you, Ami. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so let me uh, um, uh, go over the, uh, the point that we made in the previous lectures. So we, uh, we got introduced with various techniques for characterizing uh, symplectic singularities. Uh, we looked at dimension formulas for the dimension of the modular space. Uh, we looked at the global symmetry in ways of extracting the global symmetry, either from a Higgs branch or from a Coulomb branch of a theory. Uh, we saw the, um, the, the Hilbert series formulas for the, the monopole formula. And we also saw <clears throat> the Hasse diagram for, um, for symplectic singularity and we derived it in two different ways. One uh, using the Higgs mechanism in case that there is a Lagrangian and another one was uh, using um, the method of quiver subtraction uh, uh, in case there is a Coulomb description of the modular space. Now, um, in this lecture, I will devote the time to show how we can uh, derive or construct magnetic weavers from various uh, brain systems. Uh, th this is, uh, in fact, the missing link. Uh, once uh, I have, an, I, I know how to embed a theory uh, in a, In, in a brain system, I could uh, once uh, read the electric theory that I start with, and then I can read the magnetic theory uh, from the same brain system. And this helps me in understanding uh, strong coupling uh, physics, uh, in particular on three and, uh, sorry, four and five and six dimensions. Okay, so uh, in fact, uh, I, I chose to start with the uh, with brain webs and, and the, the way we derive magnetic quivers from brain webs. And the reason I chose uh, brain webs is that they uh, give a very rich uh, structure of uh, uh, situations where one can derive uh, magnetic quivers. Um, the uh, there are also uh, derivations of uh, magnetic weavers in other dimensions, three and uh, six dimensions, but uh, it seems like brain webs are uh, the, the richest of them. So, so we will go over them and then towards the end, we will see some example in six dimensions. Now, wh what are they good for? So using brain webs are, are good for constructing uh, five dimensional uh, gauge theories and uh, we will see a few examples. Uh, and the main question that we will ask is uh, to figure out what happens to the Higgs branch as I tune uh, some of the uh, parameters of the, uh, of the theory. Okay. Um, okay, now remember, once I have a magnetic quiver, I can apply all of the techniques that uh, we went over. We mentioned global symmetry, Hasse diagram, Hilbert series, high square generating function. So uh, in many ways, getting the magnetic quiver is, uh, is giving me quite a, a lot of information about the modular space. Okay, so um, the first example that uh, we will consider is uh, the case of an SU2 gauge theory. And so I call the, the theory E3. E3 is a, a product of two uh, groups, A1, SU2 times SU3. And, uh, and, the, and the gauge theory is, uh, is, is this gauge theory that you see over here. It's an SU2 gauge theory with two flavors. Now, um, it's well known from the, well, in the 90s that uh, SU2 with N flavors uh, has a, 
a heat sponge, which as you tune the gauge coupling to infinity, becomes a En plus one, right? So if I start with N flavors, the, uh, the moduli space is a minimal En plus one uh, nilpotent orbit. Now, in the case where the, uh, um, the, the symmetry or the algebra is E3, I have a very interesting situation that the, um, uh, there, there are two gauge groups. And if I think of the moduli space as a moduli space of instantons, then the instanton can either be in the uh, SU2 theory or it can be in the SU3 theory. Now, the result, the moduli space is a union of two codes, right? So it's the union of minimal A2 closure and minimal A1 closure. So let us see how we can derive this from the uh, bridge system. Now, this is a known result. This is a known result from the 90s. Uh, uh, the uh, derivation here using brains is a new part. So here's the, uh, the, here's the brain system. So you could see that there are two finite D5 brains here on an interval, uh, which constitute an SU2 gauge theory. Uh, uh, this line over here gives one flavor and this line over here gives the other flavor. And I can think of the, the uh, vertical lines here as uh, the analogs of the Schwarz five brains, which uh, constitute the, the theory. So that's an SU2 gauge theory with two flavors. Now it has several parameters. So I can uh, move this line up and down. I can also move this line up and down and I can uh, change the distance uh, along here. So three parameters. The, this distance uh, would give roughly the gauge coupling. Uh, I'll have the two masses, which are roughly given by uh, the, the position of those two lines. So there are two masses. And there is also the vacuum expectation value, which is roughly the size, the distance between those two lines here. Okay, so as I go to the origin of the Coulomb branch by setting the uh, um, vacuum expectation value to zero and by setting the masses to zero and the inverse coupling also to zero, I reach this phase of the, uh, of the brain system. And something very interesting happens when I reach this phase. I can now uh, divide the web that uh, I have here into different subwebs. Uh, over here, there's no way I can divide the, this web into subwebs without uh, breaking supersymmetry. So it's a single object. This single object, you can think of it as moving um, in and out of the board. And there are uh, these circles here are denoting uh, seven brains of various types. This is a D7, this is the S dual of a D7. And uh, this one is, we can think of it as a one, one, seven. Now, um, so, so I can think of this, uh, this phase where uh, the vacuum expectation value is non-zero, so I'm away along the Coulomb branch. I set the masses to be some non-zero value and the gauge coupling is finite. Right? Then there is no X punch. I, I can only move the, uh, the whole uh, brain system uh, as a single object. On the other hand, when I take this limit, the, uh, uh, this uh, brain web becomes uh, reducible and I can divide it into several uh, components. And there are two ways of doing it. Here's one way. Uh, I have three straight lines, so I just divide them to the three straight lines, blue, red, and green. And um, each one of them now can move individually. Uh, there are three moduli in total. I have to remove an overall uh, center of mass modulo. So I'm left with a two-dimensional moduli space. This is going to depict for me the Higgs branch of the theory. Any questions so far?
Okay. So now I can uh, I, I can think about the um, the way these guys uh, uh, intersect. So between the blue and the green line, there is uh, one intersection, and so at this intersection, I can stretch uh, the free brain, which uh, would become massless if they are on top of each other. But if they are away from each other, then it's a, a tensionful. Uh, the three brain. I'm going to consider the three brain as a, a virtual object. And so um, it will be encoded in the magnetic quiver as a nodes for each line. So I have three lines uh, in the brain system, three nodes in the quiver, one per each uh, line. And I have a, an intersection between each pair of them. So the blue intersects with the green once, the green with the red once, and the blue and the red once. So there are three lines connecting those uh, brain systems. This is the magnetic quiver. Now I compute the uh, Coulomb branch of this uh, quiver, and I find a known result, minimal A2 reproducing the uh, known expectation for the modular space. Uh, any questions about this derivation? Okay, so uh, now um, you see that I can uh, uh, subdivide this system here uh, another time into this brain system, which has this Y-shaped uh, brain system, the blue and the red. Now, instead of uh, three different brain webs, I only have two sub-brain webs, and they intersect each other like in this picture, in two places, and therefore uh, I'll have two different three brains which can stretch between them, and the way I will depict it in the magnetic point, magnetic quiver, uh, the blue one will get a node, the red will get another node, and uh, there are two lines connecting them. Okay, because the intersection is two. So um, the three, the Coulomb branch of this quiver is also well known to be a closure of minimal A one, reproducing the second part. Now, this is a union of two cones. Uh, I can only uh, have uh, those two brain systems coincide at the origin, right? So I can start with this brain system where the two brains are far apart. Only when they touch, I can move to the new branch where I subdivide into three uh, webs over here. And so these are two cones which meet at the origin, as expected from this uh, modular space system. Any questions? Okay, so let's uh, proceed to uh, the next effect. Uh, we're going to uh, move up with the number of flavors. Uh, we're going to take SU2 with three flavors. Uh, when I tune the gauge coupling, the uh, modular space is going to be minimal E4, and E4 is equal to A4. So I really should expect uh, the closure of minimal SU5 uh, or minimal SL5 in this uh, modular space. Let's see how it goes. So here's the toric diagram for the corresponding uh, brain system. Here's the brain system itself. Notice that uh, for every line, there is an orthogonal line here. This picture, so the, the, the transition between this diagram and this brain web is that a phase maps to a, a, a node. A face here maps to an intersection and an edge uh, maps to um, an orthogonal edge. 
okay? Okay, so here's the brain system. And again, I have several moduli. This time I, I should expect three masses, one gauge coupling and one modulus, right? So one gauge coupling, one modulus, three masses. The three masses are given by positions of those three lines over here. The gauge coupling is the distance and the vacuum expectation value is uh, this distance. When I send all of them to zero, I get the following brain system with the seven brains that are connected at the ends of each one of them. And now I can uh, look for a subdivision of this brain system. Note here that for this brain system, I'm not allowed to subdivide uh, without breaking supersymmetry. Only when I send all of these parameters to zero, uh, I get this uh, uh, brain system. And uh, there's only one subdivision as opposed to the previous case, uh, check uh, a consistent subdivision will give you only this. So now I have uh, red, green, this purple, this type of uh, brown and orange. Okay, so um, five different subwebs. And the next thing I need to do is to figure out the, uh, the way they are uh, connected to each other. So here are the five different webs, each with magnetic one. And uh, next uh, I just uh, work out that uh, along this seven brain, there is uh, one uh, web which is connected to this red one over here. And I can stretch a virtual D3 brain between uh, the two. Uh, along the seven brain well volume, and um, this will give me one hypermarket web over here. Okay, now this red is also connected to an orange uh, through here, this intersection. The orange is connected to a blue uh, again through this intersection. The blue intersects with the green, so that's this line that we have. And finally, uh, the green is connected to this uh, uh, web. This is the web that is, we started with. So we nicely form a necklace uh, quiver. And this is quite surprising. For me, it was very surprising to find this result because the, uh, when you look at this brain system, it doesn't look uh, at all that uh, it should look like a, a necklace quiver. But if you work up, if you work out the, uh, the way those brains are uh, uh, interacting with each other, then you'll find this uh, quiver. You further compute the Coulomb branch of this magnetic quiver, and indeed you get the known result, minimally four closure. And uh, this is a very nice way of deriving the moduli space of s three flavors at infinite coupling. Any questions? Ami, I have a question. Yes. So um, for the SU2 with two flavors and the SU2 with three flavors, uh, you could have uh, worked out the magnetic quivers using just a standard type 2B uh, construction, right? Using orientifold five planes. Yes, at, at finite coupling. Say it again? At finite coupling, not infinite, right? At finite coupling, but you would still derive these same quivers, right? Like SU2 with the three. Electric, the electric weavers, not, not the magnetic weaver. For, for the magnetic weaver, I will have to go to an infinite coupling, right? So this is a crucial point. Uh, at final coupling, I will get a different quiver. Remember you that. If you, if you get rid of one of the U1s. Um, uh, isn't this the, uh, let's see. Do you have one extra node or no? So SU2 with three should give you uh, the mirror of U1 with four flavors, right? Uh, yes, and, and that's- And that's what you're getting. Yes, yes. Yes, so then, then I should think it's like the normal S duality should be equivalent to your 
magnetic quiver in this particular case, at least. But only, but but, but where is the part that you uh, um, you make the distinction between finite coupling and infinite coupling? Right? Remember, SU three SU two with three flavors has a moduli space which is not minimal a four at finite coupling. It's uh, the minimal SO six instanton, and the minimal SO six instanton is uh, that's a three and not a four. It's a different model. Okay, okay. Right? That's right. And, and here, so I, I should have probably made right. the distinction between finite coupling and uh, an infinite coupling. And then you would see that when, when the coupling is finite, the you get minimal A3, whereas when the coupling is mi infinite. Right, right. In, yeah, I think that's the difference. There's an extra note. In this. Okay, good, good. Yeah. And then the connectivity is also looking different. So that's a very important uh, point to, to, to think about. Um, uh, yeah, in fact, uh, here, um, this theory, SC2 with four flavors, if you do the, uh, the finite coupling Higgs branch, you get minimal D4. And if you do the infinite coupling Higgs branch, you get minimal defined. And so uh, this figure shows you how uh, you get uh, minimal defined, right? So, so this is the brain system you start with. Again, you see SU2, uh, those two, uh, four flavors, one, two, three, and four. Uh, this value is roughly the gauge coupling. Uh, there are four masses given by the positions of those brains. And there is the vacuum expectation value, the distance between these two. So when I set all of these parameters to zero, I get this brain system like that, where I keep track of the seven brains uh, that were here. I had eight of them, and I still have eight, seven brains. This is the toric diagram in case you want to compare. Now, uh, how do I read the magnetic quiver from here? Uh, I have um, this uh, subweb uh, description, and the new feature is what I call non multiplicity. Between those two seven brains, I have two uh, five brains that can move independently. Therefore, uh, I have a blue node with a label two. And also the green guys, two five brains which can move independently between the two seven brains. And uh, as a result, I have a green node of label two. And uh, the, uh, the green brains are connected to this uh, purple one. So I'll get this link between them, the blue, it's connected to this red here, to the orange as well. So I have the, these two uh, links. And uh, there is also uh, this one, which is connected to the grid. Okay. And most importantly, there are intersections uh, between the blue and the green. In total, there are four intersections, which are represented by this hypermultiple over here. In total, I get the affine Dinkin diagram of the five. And if I compute the uh, three dimensional Coulomb branch of this quiver, I get minimal D5 reproducing the known result that uh, SU2 with four flavors at infinite coupling is a minimal D5. Any questions? Okay, so importantly, we have the normal multiplicity. Let's see the next effect. Uh, now we get to the E6 case. So that corresponds to SC2 with five flavors. We tune the coupling to infinity. This is the brain web. Uh, this is the toric diagram. There are nine uh, lines. Uh, which, uh, so nine external seven brains here. And um, they should represent 
the, uh, the different uh, the, the five masses that I have and the gauge coupling, uh, as well as the uh, distance here, which is the uh, vacuum expectation value. I send all of those guys to zero and I get this brain system uh, from which I see that there are three brain webs, which are identical brain webs. They, are, they all look the same. They can move as a single object, but three of them, right? So I have three independent moduli to move uh, between those three seven brains like that. In addition to two uh, in each side, two here and two here. And finally one, one and one. So I get a breaking. There's one in the middle and two, one, two, one, and two, one. I get those three legs. And uh, this uh, is going to be the corresponding magnetic quiver. Uh, so uh, th these colors over here would follow this line, one, two, and three. So I have one, two, and three connected by an edge in each case. Uh, the central three are connected to two and one and two and one. So this is what we see, two and one, two and one. Simple edges connecting them. Uh, the resulting magnetic quiver is the affine Dinkin diagram of physics. I compute the 3D column branch, I get this result, and this reproduces a, a known result from the non that this is a normalized space. Any question? Now you could see the pattern. Uh, what I can do next is to construct any, uh, any brain web that I wish. Right. Uh, so what, what we did so far was to make sure that this system um, reproduces results that were known before. So it agrees perfectly with everything that we knew before. But uh, this also generates plenty of new cases that we have not seen before. And so it gives many predictions for the behavior of uh, gauge theories in five dimensions at strong coupling. Okay, any questions about the technique, the method that we're using or any other conceptual questions? Okay, let's turn to another example. Uh, this time- There's a uh, question from Ashwin. Yes. So He's asking the Higgs branch at infinite coupling is the Coulomb branch of this quiver? Yes, that's the, yes. Let's uh, yeah. go back. Yeah, so, so this is the, uh, th that's what I'm after. And the way I do it is to compute the magnetic quiver. And from this, uh, once I have the magnetic quiver, I compute the 3D Coulomb branch and I get the result for the Higgs punch at infinite coupling. So I, I, I don't have to do it at infinite coupling. I can also tune those moduli as I wish. I can tune to, to be uh, two zero masses, one uh, finite coupling, uh, anything you want, right? You'll get some web, you have to translate these in, uh, uh, tuning of moduli into uh, an action on the brain wave. And then the question that you want to ask is how many subwebs can I divide this uh, resulting uh, web system? And this will give me the Higgs punch which comes out of the uh, corresponding uh, uh, point in the parameter space and on the moduli space, right? So remember that A is a vacuum expectation value of a scalar field in five dimensions, wh while M and G are the uh, parameters of the theory. They are modular, they are uh, uh, slowly moving. They are not dynamical moduli. They are just uh, parameters of the Lagrangian. And I can tune them as I wish and figure out what is the Higgs punch at any interesting point that I could uh, think of. 
So there are two more questions. The yes. first one is from Jacques. He's yes. asking, where did the jump from 5D to 3D come from? Uh, so the, remember that uh, the, um, uh, the um, we, are, we are thinking, we, we are really, what we are really doing is electric magnetic duality. Right? So I can take this brain system here and I can read the uh, uh, electric river, which is this one, by doing the usual uh, perturbative open strings that uh, we know. We take D brains, we stretch fundamental strings between them, and this allows us to say that there is an SU2 theory, uh, there is a, um, a, a, a fundamental string that should stretch between those two, and that would give me a fundamental flavor like, like in here. Right, so that's a string perturbation theory. This is the electric theory. What is the magnetic theory? So what I need to do is to remember that uh, for every uh, brain system, there is the magnetic dual, the mag magnetic dual degrees of freedom. In this particular case, we are dealing with uh, the magnetic object, which are three brains, right? So uh, uh, if for D5 brain, the electric uh, excitation will be a fundamental string ending on the D5. Uh, I could ask what is the magnetic excitation that will be a D3 brain, which ends on the, uh, on the D5 brain. Or it, should, it, should, or it could also end a D3 brain on an S brain. That's again a magnetic excitation. In fact, a D3 brain can end on any PQ5 brain right, as a magnetic excitation. So those are the magnetic degrees of freedom. So what I do here is not really go down to three dimensions. What I do is I think of the magnetic degrees of freedom. Remember that the uh, 3D Coulomb branch is a, is a modular space of magnetic objects. These are uh, um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the objects that live on the dual lattice, right? The, I, I'm constructing the Coulomb branch as the space of dressed monopole operators. And so what I really need to think is not about three dimensions. I need to think about co-dimension three, right? So the D3 brain inside the A5 brain is a co-dimension three object. And that's the thing which gives me the magnetic quiver. I just switch to the magnetic degrees of freedom and extract the uh, uh, magnetic excitations from this uh, brain system and you see how this conceptual point really is successful in deriving many known results and many other uh, which were not known before. Okay, there is another question from Ashwin. Uh, yes. The question is, is there a similar story in 5D for K instanton moduli spaces for K greater than one? Um, so when you say a similar story, you want to get the magnetic quiver for uh, the um, modular space of instantons, right? Uh, which we already know how it looks like for uh, affine algebras. So we just need to verify that uh, this is the case. I haven't tried, but uh, I'm sure uh, the, the, you'll get a very nice uh, results uh, in this way. Um, it's, it's actually a nice challenge to try. So remember, for A-type, a uh, we, we know that it looks like a necklace quiver, and um, we just need to verify that uh, this is the case. Uh, we may have had, um, uh, yeah, I believe we had in, in uh, the paper with um, Futoshi Yagi and Santiago Cabrera, Towards the end, we did the two instantons of E6 of the exceptional algebra. And uh, very nicely, we got the uh, expected results. Okay, there are no more questions, so maybe you can proceed. Thank you. Uh, okay. 
Um, so the next point is to, um, so we, we, we first saw in the previous case examples, we saw that uh, we have node multiplicities, three, two, and one. What I want to show now that is we can also get edge multiplicity. And for this, we take a very simple uh, theory, um, super and mills, uh, SUN, uh, choose the level to be zero. And again, ask what happens when I tune the coupling to infinity. So uh, we use the, uh, uh, the routine. So first embedded in terms of brains, here's the brain system over here. Uh, so I get N parallel D5 brains. They modify the, uh, the external brains. So if I insist that uh, those two remain uh, in the Vesvart's five brains, uh, this modifies the, those two external brains to be of this type. And here's the brain system. Uh, next, uh, the, the theory has only uh, one parameter, that's the gauge coupling, and the rest are moduli, the distances here. Since I have n uh, d brains here, there are n minus one distances between them. So I can set all of them to zero. I move to the origin of the moduli space, and then I get this brain system, very crucially, uh, those two external brains are parallel and they form a single brain as I set all of those parameters to zero. And those two NS brains here also coincide and become one single brain. And only at this point, I can see that they can uh, split, right? They can move independently uh, away from the board and uh, or away from the screen, in and out of the screen. And now I have a new modulus which shows up. And that's one very surprising uh, effect in five dimensions that even though I start with the theory that has no hypermultiplets, no meta fields, as I tune, uh, as I move to the origin of the Coulomb branch and tune the coupling to infinity, I uh, recover a new Higgs branch uh, the effect happens from uh, having massless gauge instantons, and those gauge instantons form a, a Higgs branch, even though we started with no Higgs branch, with no matter fields. Next, I proceed as before. Uh, I can subdivide into two uh, five brains like that. And next, I, I ask how many ways can I uh, intersect those, and, uh, and and this will correspond to n different three brains, which can uh, stretch uh, between the uh, those uh, two five brains, leading to uh, one node for the red guy, one node for the blue, and n c different uh, intersections between them. Uh, uh, next thing in the algorithm is to compute the uh, 3D Coulomb branch or the space of magnetic breast monopole operators uh, and gives me C2 mod Zn. So here's the result uh, that the X branch at infinite coupling of uh, SU and C super mills is uh, C2 mod Zn. Um, uh, if you want, the case NC equals to two was known as C2 mod Z2. Uh, all other cases are uh, predictions from this technique. Uh, it was also known before. So um, just reproducing uh, results uh, in, in this uh, new neat way. Questions? Uh, I'm. Uh, how did you read off the multiplicity of of the the three brains that can connect these? It's it. Uh, the only thing I see different from 
the previous pictures is the is the angle of this uh, uh, red. Um, yes, very nice, very nice question. So um, one way of uh, thinking about it is to um, take the duality from type two B to uh, M theory. And uh, we know that uh, a PQ brain that uh, wraps um, a, a torus uh, would, uh, so it would wrap it in uh, these particular angles that uh, we see over here. <coughs> Sorry. So the, uh, the, the angle where you wrap the torus, it goes P times along uh, one circle and Q along the other. And so you could think of a line that wraps in several ways until it uh, closes. And uh, th that's another one. So if you draw the, uh, this uh, configuration on the toes, you will really find that those intersection points are now separate from each other. And really there are n of them. Um, so that's a nice exercise. I, I hope you see this thing. Right? So imagine that uh, you, you have uh, some uh, uh, one type of wrapping and then another, and you just count intersections and you get that this is this. You could also uh, phrase it in terms of a two by two matrix, take the this vector and this vector, form them into a two by two matrix and compute the determinant. This will give you the intersection number between those two PQ uh, brains. So it's a, it's a beautiful piece of, uh, of string duality, in fact. Any more questions? Okay. Can we move to the next example? Uh, in the next example, uh, we we picked a, a you know it, it, on the face of it it looks like a random choice. I, I take SQ five, the chance summons level is one, and the number of flavors is six. More generally, I could uh, take a three parameter family: number of colors, number of flavors, and the chance summons level. And for each one of those cases, I can ask uh, what happens as I tune the gauge coupling to infinity. And as I move uh, to the origin of the Coulomb branch, what kind of Higgs prime shows up? Now, the reason we picked this example is because of this phenomenon. Uh, the, uh, the Higgs branch at the infinite coupling becomes a union of three cones. Uh, we, we saw the case of two cones. Uh, we also know of classical Higgs branches where there are uh, unions of uh, two cones. In this case, I have union of three cones which show up only at infinite coupling. And so uh, let's, let's go over the, um, the details of this example. This is the toric diagram. This is the brain web. You see they the nice, nicely fit as uh, dual uh, diagrams. Uh, I make sure to end every external uh, five brain by an appropriate D7 brain. Remember that the PQ5 brain ends on the PQ7 brain. Uh, next, I move to the origin. So all of those lines uh, collapse on one point. And I also uh, take the gauge coupling to uh, zero. So, so all of those dis distances that are present in this figure now uh, collapse. In this picture, there are no distances uh, at all. And um, now I, um, uh, um, well, well, maybe I should correct that uh, the distance here is not a relevant uh, parameter for the, the low energy theory. Uh, and, and therefore we, we, we do consider this uh, brain wave as characterizing the uh, conformal field theory that uh, is at the uh, root of this uh, um, uh, gauge T. It's the UV completion of this gauge T. So um, I, I, I get this brain web here. 
now I have the task of uh, understanding how many subwebs. So uh, now you could see a challenge, right? The, if, if I give you an arbitrary uh, brain web, the more uh, external lines I will have, the more uh, complicated the question will be uh, of uh, understanding uh, how many subwebs can I construct from this, uh, this uh, uh, initial web, but not just how many, so, so how many, the question how many is, is going to give me the number of codes. Uh, but for each subdivision, I also need to compute the corresponding quiver as we see over here. And so I will have to compute the way each subweb intersects with the other subwebs. Right? And so that's going to become a, a challenge as we increase the number of brains more and more. Uh, on the other hand, the benefit will be uh, that I can understand the uh, uh, strong coupling physics of many uh, five dimensional theories. So uh, let's look at the, uh, um, the details. So first of all, since there are three subdivisions, the uh, moduli space is a union of three cones, C1, C2, and C3. And uh, they, in detail, uh, I could just see that I could either take this as an independent subweb, and then there is a line one, two, three, and two, three, two, one, like that of uh, other brains. So this would give me this particular brain web. Uh, or alternatively, I can take one line here, one line here, and combine into a subweb. And here's the red subweb. So clearly, those are different uh, subwebs and check what I have remaining. And finally, I can take this blue subweb where I have uh, one line here, one line here, and two lines over here. And then this uh, red, two, one, one here, and one here. Right. So that's going to become more and more of a challenge to do those subdivisions. If I miss, one subdivision, I miss the whole cone in the Higgs branch, so I better not uh, do that. Uh, and uh, there we go. We compute the uh, magnetic rivers, taking into account node multiplicity, edge multiplicity, and uh, we get those uh, final results. Uh, next thing I want to do is to figure out whether there are intersections between C1, C2, C2, C3, and C1, C3. Any questions? So let's pick some example of the intersections. The, the, if you want to see all of the details there in the paper with a Futoshi Yagi and Santiago Cabrera. Um, so here's the intersection of uh, uh, two cones, C1 and C2. What I do is uh, this is the cone, this is the subweb or subdivision for uh, C1, this is the subdivision for C2. What I look for is a common brain web. Uh, which uh, can be uh, uh, derived by combining some of the subwebs here and some of the subwebs here, such that they are uh, sharing the same uh, um, uh, subweb. So that's the intersection. Once I derive the intersection, I repeat the computation of uh, intersections between the different subwebs, uh, derive a quiver, Computed 3D Coulomb branch, and this is the, the um, intersection between the two moduli spaces. Uh, I could also take all three cones and uh, look for the intersection between all of them. So there is this one big thing here, which is common to all three. And now I compute the intersection with the remaining guys. I get this. Quiver. The quiver becomes simpler and simpler as I compute more intersections. And uh, I find that 
the triple intersection is the uh, minimal SL6 milpotent orbit. Uh, any questions? So Ami, you have about 10 minutes to go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so uh, here, uh, uh, what I want to demonstrate is that, uh, in fact, in, in a different paper, we, we, we use the method of brain webs to compute uh, four dimensional moduli spaces with n equal to supersymmetry uh, and just SQCD. Now, what's the, the problem with such moduli spaces? Uh, when you try to compute, th this is just a classical, uh, th those are all classical moduli spaces. X branches of SU6 with some finite box. Right? So on the face of it, you would say, okay, uh, big deal. It's a classical theory. But something very important happens in an intermediate regime, starting from six flavors all the way up to 10 flavors. The uh, moduli space is not a single cone. It's a union of two cones, which I can call the uh, mesonic branch and the baryonic branch. Here, the two intersect at the origin, but over here, the, the mesonic branch and the baryonic branch, which is these three leaves, intersect over here. And the, the more I go with the number of flavors, the bigger the intersection. Okay, so nice intersection until for 11 flavors, no more a union of two cones, just a single cone. Now, how do I know all of this structure? Uh, it's very hard. I mean, you could try and write down the uh, chiral ring. Chiral ring was worked out. Uh, from the chiral ring, it's very hard to figure out that there are two uh, uh, union of two cones. And furthermore, it's very hard to, to to see the structure. Uh, so I, I can compute the Hilbert series of the Higgs branch, but to know how to divide it into two cones is quite a tough one. So that's where we use the brain webs. We constructed the SQCD theory using the brain webs, and we looked for subdivisions of this theory, assuming that in the five dimensional classical theory, and the four-dimensional class theory, they behave in the same way. And indeed, this is what we got. And I, I could also test it. It's very easy to test because once I come to you and declare here, this is a union of this cone and this cone. And I go ahead and compute the uh, uh, Hilbert series of the uh, Higgs branch. I match the union with the computation of the uh, Hilbert series and they uh, very nicely match it together. So uh, the bottom line is that this uh, nice graph, the development of uh, these different moduli spaces as a function of number of flavors uh, was derived using the method of magnetic weavers and uh, brain waves. Any questions? Uh, now, one very crucial thing, and, and we don't have too much time, so I'll, I'll just be brief over this case. Um, it, notice that we are uh, pretty much using the same techniques. We, 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 Jacques has a question. Uh, he's asking, yes. NF equals to 13 is not asymptotically free? Um, the, of course it's not, yes, yes. It's not uh, asymptotically free, but the uh, Higgs branch is a very nice model, I suppose. I'm, I'm not doing uh, quantum uh, physics over here. I'm just doing classical physics. I'm asking the very simple uh, question. What's the structure of the classical model of this? So it's a question, for instance, that would make perfect sense in three dimensions. That's right. Yes. right. OK, fine. Yes. And uh, you, you know, the, this division to three regime, regimes, the, this is the nilpotent or orbit uh, part. Uh, now it's no longer nilpotent orbit, it's union of two cones. And uh, this part where uh, they become uh, nicely behaved. 
also look D5, D4, D3, this line you could be as D2, and then this uh, union starts going down like that. A very nice pattern that you could uh, learn from this uh, structure. Very nice questions, thank you. Uh, and and what, what I was saying is that um, we, we pretty much use the same uh, techniques. Uh, you give me a physical theory, I embed it in terms of brains, I extract from this brain system, electric quiver once, the magnetic quiver second time, and the magnetic quiver gives me answers about the strongly coupled behavior. And, uh, and, and repetitive application of this reveals a whole set of new phenomena. I just need to uh, focus on the corresponding dimension and the different effect which uh, happens. So it's a very rich uh, uh, story uh, and many, many new phenomena to discover. Um, the next point uh, is the uh, well-known uh, small instant on transition where one tensor multiplet is traded for 29 hyper multiplets that form the modular space of uh, minimal E8. And uh, since we don't have much time, uh, I'll just uh, 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 go through it. So I start with one and five next to nine, and this is uh, a zero singularity, uh, and then um, I move to the type 2a description, one in negation of five brain, one d6, eight d8, and one o8 minus plane. This is the electric quiver. Uh, here's the magnetic quiver. The next thing I do is to uh, move uh, this negation uh, of five brain to the orientiform plane. As it moves, there is brain creation. So that's the first thing which happens uh, for each time, each time it crosses a D8 brain, there is brain creation. And the next thing to do is to move inside the orientiform plane with the image, becomes two independent NS brains and this brain configuration. I read the magnetic river, this is what I get. And uh, this is actually a redundant, uh, uh, that's a, a center of mass motion for the instanton, but the remaining thing is the E8 affine uh, dinking diagram. So very nicely reproduces the small instant transition. I could start with many other uh, configurations, increase number of six brains, increase number of five brains, and we'll get magnetic quivers in the same technique and this is a very rich story. Any questions? So here's a, another example. Um, SC2 with 10 flavors ends up with this magnetic river. Here's the Hasse diagram at infinite coupling, and here's the Hasse diagram at finite coupling. Uh, one last comment and then we finish. Uh, this phenomenon of uh, tensionless strings and discrete uh, gauging in SU2 with the four flavors, uh, this is the way I construct the, the theory. Um, and this is already uh, in the form of the magnetic rivers because the six brains are in between eight brains. I read the magnetic river, this is it, it is what I expect, a finite coupling, but uh, when I tune the distance here to, to zero, and then coincide, I get this magnetic quiver, and look what happens to the Hasse diagram. From uh, minimal D4, it becomes next to minimal D3, and, and so that's the effect of uh, Z2 uh, quotient. And this, the Coulomb branch of this quiver is the Z2 orbifold of this, of the Coulomb branch of this quiver. So discrete gauging when N and five brains coincide on an A-type singularity, a symmetric group of order N is, uh, on N elements is uh, gauged.
Um, yeah, the same thing happens for S2, three with six flavors, S2 gauging, and this is the effect on the Hasse diode. Only at the top. Okay, uh, I'm uh, ready to finish uh, the series. Uh, we had a series of three different talks. Uh, we talked about, um, um, let's, uh, let's do it in the order. We talked about uh, uh, phase diagrams uh, and, and those are really nice. Way, they, they form a very nice way uh, that uh, uh, we view and think about uh, uh, symplectic singularities. Uh, brain systems are quite crucial in uh, uh, any of the steps that we make. So uh, even though brain systems are, uh, have been around for many years, they still prove to be uh, quite uh, fruitful in extracting uh, uh, strong coupling results in, in places where we couldn't do it in the past. Magnetic quivers are, is a new concept. Uh, which encodes all of the data which we need in order to understand strongly coupled modular spaces. And finally, the monopole formula uh, is uh, the thing which uh, opened all of this, the window to these uh, achievements. So uh, thank you very much for uh, listening. And I hope to be able to report on uh, more exciting results. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Ami. Uh, so let's have question answers. Uh, so Ashwin already has a question. So Ashwin, would you like to ask it directly? Yes. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you, Ami, for the wonderful series of lectures. Uh, so my question is about the notion of uh, node multiplicity. Uh, so uh, is that something that one can define in a mathematically precise way? I mean, there, there are a lot of mathematicians who study quiver I mean, quivers for various reasons, but uh, off late even quivers for like studying Coulomb branches and so on. Uh, what would this mean to them? What is node multiplicity? Is no, it the ones where you have... yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, so it, 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 from the point of view of the brain system is just that they have two identical copies of the same object, right? So uh, look, look over here. Right? Yeah, or, or yeah. Uh, let's look at... Um, so, so uh, yeah, Here, here's the node multiplicity two. I look at mm -hmm. the brain system, I just see two segments, two identical segments, mm -hmm. which are uh, moving independently. So um, I, I'm not sure whether to define it. It's, it's a very intuitive uh, concept. Over here, there is a three, right? So three green lines, which are moving independently, forming three moduli. <laughs> And, so, uh, in, is in the usual quiver, this is, isn't it just the, the rank of the group at, associated yeah, yeah. to the node? I mean, that that's a seems a fairly garden variety concept. I mean, the quivers oh, he draws yeah. are not uh, unintelligible to uh, any mathematician who deals with quivers. They, they look perfectly standard. Okay, then maybe I just misunderstood what those labels meant. Uh, let's look at the, uh, let's look at the case of E6, right? So, so I, I have, I, I, I start with this brain system, I move to the limit, and now I have three copies of this uh, fork-shaped or Y-shaped um, um, uh, brains in the middle, and those are three identical copies. So it's the brain oh, number. Okay, okay. So, uh, sorry, then I, I think I just, it's talking about the multiple stages, you know, you want you want with with two or three or n by fundamentals. Is, is that what you're asking, Ashwin? The ones that sort of look like non-simply layers. They, the, there was not just one dash. There was more than one dash. Maybe that is not what you call node multiplicity. Maybe the oh, edge multiplicity. multiplicity. Edge multiplicity. Edge multiplicity. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, my bad. I'm sorry. Bad. Uh, okay, yeah. so let's go for the here's edge multiplicity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's what I meant to ask about. And, and here it's, uh, I think mathematically, it's just the intersection numbers between the, um, um, between the uh, different uh, webs. There's actually an extension of it coming from tropical geometry. So if you look at the paper, 
-hmm. we, uh, we took results and uh, we, we consulted uh, one of the tropical geomet geometers by the name of uh, Ervan uh, Brugale. And uh, he uh, pointed us towards uh, this notion of um, a stable intersection, uh, which uh, allows to uh, get this uh, edge multiplicity over here. So, so in this case, uh, the way I explained to Jacques was that uh, you get it by wrapping uh, PQ brains on the torus. So when you do that, you just get a, um, a, an expansion. Right? So, so instead of having two brains uh, meeting at the point, you, uh, once you wrap the torus, you'll find that you'll have those two brains meeting at endpoints. You just uh, separate them. And, and, of, and of course, the limit from M theory to type 2B is to take the size of the torus uh, to zero. And then all of those uh, intersection points coincide. But uh, this is a typical trick that we use in, in brain systems in order to understand the physics of what happens. What we do is to resolve it a bit, to, to take them away from each other. And, and then we, we understand what happens. So the, here's another example. Um, so I was uh, asking over here, right? So I have this, this um, Y shape blue and Y shape red. And I want to understand uh, how, how many intersection points do you have between them? So if I draw it like that, it's difficult. I, I, I don't know what to do. Uh, it seems like uh, they coincide at one point. But if I just move them a little bit, then I clearly see that they intersect at, the, at two points. And this is uh, what uh, Ervan Brugale calls a stable intersection. Because no matter how I will move them away from each other, this notion of intersection two will uh, remain uh, valid. Uh, and so th that's why we say uh, two points of intersection and uh, when we draw the quiver, uh, one node per Y shape and two uh, points of intersection, so it's edge of multiplicity two. Okay, so so that's uh, and in the paper we 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 just treat more complicated cases. You, you want not just intersections but also to include the effect of uh, seven brains because sometimes they show up. And so in the paper we have a precise uh, uh, conjectures for uh, the computations. So should we then expect like something like the BFN uh, definition of the column branch can also uh, extend to these cases with uh, edge multiplicities? Is that reasonable to expect? Yes, yes. It's, it's very easy to um, include the notion of uh, edge multiplicity into the uh, monopole formula. I think uh, I talked to Nakajima, he, he accepts that. He, he has no problem with that, for example. Uh, okay. So he, he would even do uh, worse. He, he would uh, have one multiplicity in one direction and one in another. He also accept that, but that would be, this would be called um, non simply laced. But here, those guys are still simply laced. It's just, Edge, which can have several multiplicities. We also saw it in the work of uh, Philippe Bolt, if you've seen his uh, quivers. So Philippe uh, uh, introduces the notion of complete graphs, where every uh, pair of nodes is connected by an, an edge, but uh, all edges have the same multiplicity. So uh, he has those complete graphs. I, I should have uh, copied them over here because we did use them to compute uh, Coulomb branches. We, we have a, a paper with Michele Del Zotto where, where, we could, where, where we compute the Coulomb branches and those are Coulomb branches for uh, some Algiers Douglas uh, uh, points. So very nicely you could uh, use that and uh, you could extract uh, the same data that we are talking about uh, dimension, symmetry, Hasse diagram, uh, Hilbert series, and so on. 
Cool. Um, Thank you. So, so I have a quick question. Uh, if I can ask. Yes. So, so from the field theory perspective, those those kind of multiple edges are not very um, exotic, right? It just means that you instead of you know you have an SU, instead of an SU one flavor symmetry, you have like an SU n uh, flavor symmetry coming from. Uh, multiple by fundamentals or fundamentals basically. However, I remember that uh, in, when we study the perturbative open strings, yeah. we have the limiting feature that the string has, an open string has only two ends, right? It could start in one and end in another. And right. uh, between two deep brains, I only have one type of string that can connect them. Okay. So that this will not give me edge multiplicity. I need to work harder in order to get the uh, edge multiplicity. Right. Uh, and if you go over the cases that you are familiar with, you see that most of them have no edge multiplicity just because of this thing. So electric weavers are, uh, uh, they do, but it's quite rare to, uh, to, uh, to have uh, edge multiplicity. You need an additional uh, trick in order to overcome this difficulty that a fundamental string has only two ends. Right, right, right. In contrast, when I have a magnetic object, they are uh, by, uh, uh, by construction, uh, by their nature, they are uh, extended objects and extended objects can have more uh, effects and therefore it's more common to find edge multiplicity in magnetic weapons. That's correct. I, I meant it in a slightly different way, like, you know, in the, so just to make it more precise, suppose you have a 3D uh, theory with multiple edges, like the ones that you considered, for example, with, you know, with Michele. If you look at the mirrors of those, like 3D mirrors of those, those do not have uh, multiple edges anymore. You know? But, but they, 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 they will probably have no Lagrangian at all. No, they so have like you have a proposal. Yeah, I have, I have found them in my in my paper case explicitly so, determined all of them. That's a new thing which I, I still need to absorb and to understand. Um, yes. Uh, all of those have Lagrangian mirrors. I see. Okay. And uh, okay, so we, we uh, so here there is a whole set of tests that we can perf can perform. Uh, you have the magnetic quiver, so you can compute the Higgs branch, Coulomb branch. You have the electric quiver, you have, it can compute the Higgs branch, Coulomb branch, and, and you check whether they agree or not. So it's a nice set of computations to make, and I believe they have not been done. Excellent. Okay, more questions? Um, so uh, uh, an exercise for one of the students here, check that uh, the uh, claimed uh, mirrors are uh, indeed uh, mirrors, non-trivial computation. Okay. Other questions, comments? Okay, I have one more question. So if you look at this SU2 with two flavors, in this case that you have right now on. Yes. Uh, so for for finite coupling, you also have two cones, right? You can just look at the, and that is, I, I believe, uh, two copies of the, of the closure of the minimal A1. Yes. Right? So how does, uh, so is there any intuition about how this, you know, one of them kind of remains uh, the same while the other one gets uh, gets promoted to this minimal A2? As you think. Yeah, the, the, the thing is that the, uh, the instant on all, uh, the, the gauge instantons are only charged on the one of the C2s and not on the, the other. Uh, so okay. this is uh, qu quite well understood and um, it's, uh, you, you could check it. Um, there have been uh, a collection of computations. Uh, so, so we have a paper with uh, Perlito and uh, Mercador and, and Stefan Kromanig 
So in, in this paper, we show that uh, when you decompose the states, that mm -hmm. only one of the one of the C2 acts on the instantons, the other doesn't. Um, it's because the uh, the instanton number uh, is uh, uh, a cartan of one of them, not the other. Right? So, okay. so, uh, you don't have much of a choice. And uh, you could also look at uh, some uh, other computation. So, so the, the work of uh, uh, Kim Yong Lee mm -hmm. and uh, So Kim, the, also Hichon, they they, um, they computed some five-dimensional index, and from the index they showed that there is an enhancement of the global symmetry. And so you could uh, trace the the way the gauge instantons are charged for this particular case, and again mm -hmm. you will find that it is charged under one C2 but not the other. So um, yeah, in, in, in the paper with the, with Ferrito, we worked out the details of the Kaya ring. So we wrote the Kaya rings for the classical theory, and we showed how it gets corrected when you include the uh, effect of the, those uh, massless instances. Other questions, comments? All right, if not, then let's thank Ami again. Thank you very much.